Welcome to Outrage Overload, a science podcast about outrage and lowering the temperature. This is episode 26. This is a very special episode for me. Our guest for this episode is one of my favorite science communicators out there right now and has been a kind mentor to me in this podcast adventure. His time is in great demand, yet he made time for me when the podcast was little more than a loose idea. Something or maybe nothing, as I described it to him at the time. Hi there, I'm David McRaney. I'm a science journalist and author and podcaster and lecturer and just person who talks a lot, reads a lot, writes a lot about psychology, neuroscience, and all the social sciences. But what I'm really doing is just trying to put all the puzzle pieces together to figure out what are we and what are we doing and why do we do all that? Uh, I have a podcast called You Are Not So Smart, where I talk to experts on those topics every two weeks or so. And I have a new book out called How Minds Change which I will be promoting probably for the rest of my life. But you're catching me right at the high point of all of that. David McCraney's mentoring and advice has made a big impact on this show, and I can't thank him enough. If you're listening to this episode around the initial broadcast date, then Thanksgiving, our favorite holiday for political conversations, is right around the corner. In his book, How Minds Change, McCraney introduces various rhetorical techniques based on neuroscience and psychology that can facilitate productive conversations. We go over some of this in the interview, and I hope the takeaways from this episode will prove helpful in keeping the temperature down for those inevitable Thanksgiving conversations. We talked for quite a while, and because I wanted to get as much of it in here as I could, we're going to jump right in and let the conversation speak for itself. You don't want to miss a minute of it. You know, so you've been talking about this for a while now, and and you've done a lot of interviews and, and, you know, I, I'm sure you're kind of tired of the same old questions. Um, on the other hand, not all my listeners have really heard about the core aspects of the book. And I don't really want to bother you with all those questions, but I feel I, I can't just completely leave it at that. So You, you can't. You can't. I'm, I'm so totally obsessed with this topic. And, and I've learned that it's something that people are very eager to hear about. And I am very fine with the idea of sort of proselytizing or going back over certain things or introducing ideas uh, to new, new listeners and people who haven't seen them yet. So whatever, whatever you want to do, I'm there. Cool. So, you know, I I do tell almost everyone I talk to about this book. I I mention it. I think every time I've been on somebody else's podcast, I've, I've mentioned this book because I'm often asked, you know, uh, it's a common thing that I, I hear from people about, you know, Hey, so, all right, I get all this political polarization stuff. So how do I fix these guys and make it, make them think the right way? And, and, you know, I always refer them to your book and I also kind of tell them that might be a misguided idea. <laughs> yeah, the right way. <laughs> right. To finally get to the question, I wonder in that environment, how would you position uh, the how mind, your How Minds Change book? Like what role can it play in, in sort of improving that situation? Well, the I guess the largest contribution it makes to all of this is asking you, uh, is asking you, the reader, why did you buy this book? why why is this so important to you and have you asked yourself that question yet like why do you want to change someone else's mind and have you explored the possibility that you may have something you could learn from the other person and if not and if you have not asked yourself why you're doing it and you aren't even there's no part of you that is interested in seeing the world from a different perspective then what i hope to do is give you an opportunity to see why maybe you actually what you're out to do here is change your own mind about how minds change because that's what happened to me in writing this book i started it from that perspective that a lot of people i think uh, are at right now and have been for a while we're in a new information ecosystem we have all these different tools all the gatekeepers have been pushed aside and where we used to see this as a post-truth scenario it's pretty evident that now we're in a post trust scenario where it's very difficult to determine who I should trust, what sources I should trust, what groups I should trust, what experts I should, should trust. And 
in in the sort of attempt to sort ourselves in that way, we've collected into a lot of different groups, some of them virtual, some that we don't actually ever meet. We just talk to them or hang out, hang out with them online. And then in our private lives, we've cordoned ourselves off so that we only interact with people who see the world differently at family gatherings where we're expected to talk to those people. Otherwise, we've isolated ourselves into these like-minded enclaves. And some of that, it makes total sense because there are things in this world that cause harm and there are people who want to cause harm to others and there are all sorts of elements of prejudice and um, irrationality out there that you want to sort. That's understandable. But a lot of it also is just old, old primate behavior that you get uh, funneled into. And I guess the um, it comes down to something that Brooke Harrington told me. It's in the book. She said that the she's a sociologist, and she said that if there was an equals MC square of social science, it would be the fear of social death is greater than the fear of physical death. And once that's on the line, that will be the thing that motivates your behavior and your decision making and your judgment and even your interaction with novelty and ambiguity. The way that you make sense of the world will be driven by that motivation more than it will be the motivation to be quote unquote right and or to avoid being quote unquote wrong. And you can be wrong in lots of ways. You could be factually incorrect. You could be morally off base. You could be ethically uh, perhaps defunct. You could be politically skewed. You could be biased. You could be motivated by goals that you'd never admit out loud. You could have attitudes that are based off of uh, limited numbers of, ex of experiences or prejudices that you inherited from your, uh, you know, demographic. And there are all sorts of ways you could be wrong. The word wrong can mean many things. And there's all sorts of ways you could be right. The if you are eager, I try to boil it down the book into three different things because uh, there's about 10,000 different mental constructs we could be discussing here. If we're talking about changing your mind, what are we talking about? What is this mind we're discussing? What does change mean? I boil it down to beliefs, attitudes, and values because you can use those as categories to contain lots of other stuff. And so there's a way that you can be factually incorrect. Your belief in something that is uh, true or untrue could be incorrect. You could think the earth is flat, for example, or you could think that uh, there is uh, someone who's got a special cure for cancer out there on, on, on some website that uh, you can buy through Facebook or something, and they've bypassed all the checks and balances of the federal government in some way. Um, you can just think the aliens built the pyramids. There's a way, there are ways to be factually incorrect that you might be resistant to change your mind about, or, or you might be attempting to change other people's minds to those topics they might be resistant to. There's attitudinally being incorrect. That's much more in the sense of you may, uh, you know, an attitude and belief are very different. You may think uh, you might not like chocolate cake. You might say chocolate cake is disgusting, and it feels like that's that you're stating a belief, but you're really stating an attitude. That's a positive or negative evaluation of something. And this can get over into world of politics where you can say such and such president's a bad president, which is sounds like a belief, but it's actually an attitude. And shifting a person's attitude is different than shifting a belief and requires a little bit different uh, approach. But a lot of our attitudes are just simply based off of our prior experiences with the subject. And they can be way off. They could be based off very limited information or bad information. And they can also be harmful. There could be attitudes that uh, cause harm in this world, or, or they add poison to the system in some way that if you knew that, you would, you would be less likely to express it or be driven by it. And then values are where you place something on the hierarchy of uh, where your your time and, and effort and resources should be applied. And we can move things up and down that hierarchy depending on different information coming into our lives or different experiences. So I look at it like... Uh, you're, there is a type of discussion that takes place oftentimes, especially on online contexts where uh, nothing is really set up to have the kind of conversation we evolved to have around other human beings. And those discussions are often, I need to win and you need to lose. I know how the, I know the, I, I know you don't, I need to inform you. I need to educate you. And once you're educated, you'll naturally see the world that I, the way I see it. 
Um, there's this idea that if I just dump a bunch of facts on you, if I send you a bunch of YouTube links, if I tell you these books you ought to read, you should listen to this person, then you will, if you do that, which you're not going to do it, but if you did do it, you would see the world exactly the way I see it. And it's this, your, this big blind spot for how all of this requires interpretation through your priors. And you can pass a lot of information to a person and they can accept all of it and they can even admit to being factually incorrect about a lot of things and be updated in that way, but it won't really change their mind in the way you, you thought it would. And if, if you're wondering, how could that be? I mean, imagine that I walk up to you with a, a flyer that says, did you know the earth's actually flat? Here, here you go. Here's a bunch of bullet points. You should look at this. Like, there's no way, first of all, I'm probably going to throw that in the garbage, but I, if I, even if I do read it, even if there are things on there, I didn't know, like you, you, you listed a lot of things that are actually true scientifically. It's not going to snap me into seeing the world the way that you see it because I'm not driven by the same motivations you're driven by and that's missing from the conversation. So to sum it all up, I would say, like, I'll talk about the dress in the book and we can get into that if you want to, but the some people see it as black and blue. Some people see it as uh, white and gold. If you, if you were to get into a debate with someone about which way you ought to see this thing and your objective was to prove that your way of seeing it is the way to see it, even if you won that debate, you lose that debate. The idea that I'm trying to square off face to face with you in a way that my subjective reality will become your subjective reality, you wouldn't lose the opportunity to understand why do we see it differently? Like there's a deeper truth in there that's not even being discussed. It's not even on the table. And my big, what I advocate for in the book are all these different rhetorical techniques that are all based off of a lot of, you know, a hundred years of, of neuroscience and psychology that show you can instead go shoulder to shoulder with someone over anything you disagree about, even if what you disagree about has a direct impact on your life and say, Hmm, you seem to be a capable, rational, intelligent human being who has all these values and goals and concerns about the world. Some of those I share. I wonder why we, when we both look at this, we don't see the same thing. I wonder why we don't interpret this the same way. In other words, I wonder why we disagree. I wonder if we could like turn that into a mystery that we solve together. And if we do that, it turns out there's a whole new range of human interaction that wasn't on the table before that will ultimately, if you follow through with it, change both people's minds in the course of this thing. You, you Venn diagram each other. And this is really what I advocate for in the book. Yeah, you know, it's hard even to get to that point, right? Because people, um, it's, you know, it's part of our, just the way we work, that we, we, we find it very hard to believe that the person saw the same facts. Yeah, you know, there's one thing about there's fact gaps, but even when they saw the same facts, we have a hard time believing they came to a different conclusion, right? Like like what you said, oh, I'm going to take you and I'm going to say, you're. A I think you're a rational person, so how did you get to this conclusion? Even that step can be hard, getting people to that step sometimes, because they already have kind of gone to this. Because you came to this other conclusion, you must literally be insane. <laughs> right. That's the <laughs> assumption, right? As they call it naive realism, uh, the idea that um, you see the world as it is and, and f mostly free from bias. Uh, and therefore, you're getting almost a, a mainline one-to-one -one representation of things. So if, if another person doesn't see it that way, then there must be something wrong with them. They've either they, they've been fooled or they are a fool or they've been uh, they, they just haven't seen all the information yet. And that's usually where we go is that like if, if unless you think they're crazy or you think they're evil or you think that they have some sort of uh, uh, ideology or, or a spiritual practice that, that limits their ability to admit to certain things, you usually go the direction of they're just uninformed. Just they call one it more fact and they're yeah, going to have it. <laughs> they call it the information deficit. Uh, it used to be called the information deficit model. Now we call it the information deficit hypothesis because it's uh, it has ironically uh, not uh, the evidence is, has not held up. <laughs> the evidence is not in its favor. Um, it's the idea like this has been used many times through a lot of health campaigns, you know, uh, just give people all the facts about whether it's COVID or before that it was MMR vaccines or before that it was measles or just about anything like the idea, if I can just give them enough facts, they will snap into seeing things the right way. It's an old idea. The, the 19th century rationalist philosophers and the um, founding fathers and the, um, the cyberpunks, they all had different approaches. It was all, it, it comes in steps. Every time we have a, like a Marshall McLuhan technological leap, it'll be something like uh, as soon as we get 
public education. Everybody will have all have everybody will have access to all the same facts. We'll all interpret those facts the same way. Democratic utopia or public libraries. That was another concept. Is that once there's a library in every small town and village in the United States, everybody will have access to all the same information. We'll all see with that information together, interpret it the same way. Democratic utopia. And then cyberpunks were like, first it was like CD-ROMs, like if once everybody has Microsoft and Carta, but then it was the internet. The idea was like, wow, with the internet, everybody's got Wikipedia, everybody's got access to everything. Every YouTube video, there's so many YouTube videos with PhD experts. This is what'll solve things. And always what's missing from this is that people believe, th believe things for reasons. We are motivated reasoners. Um, here's my go-to example, if you wanna know where the, 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 the thing that's breaking this, and it may not be obvious to everyone is, but you've all experienced this. Have you ever had a friend who uh, recently fell in love with somebody and you ask them, what do you like about them? So what you're really asking is, please uh, demonstrate your reasoning to me. Please justify to me why you like this person so much. And, you know, people very easily do so. They'll say, I love I, 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 everything. I can't even I don't know where to start. Like the the way they walk across a room, just just try. I, I, I swoon, but they're like that. They're, they're angelic. They're like a ballet dancer. Uh, the way they the, the way they just sort of speak, the, the, the way their voice generates words. Uh, I fall into into a stupor around them. I can't, I can't get enough of it. Um, even the way they do little things, the way they cut their food, I can watch this person cut their food. I'm not kidding. Um, and the music they've introduced me to. They, this music is like a whole new world that I never knew existed and I'm so happy to have this person in their life. So they, they'll do that sort of thing and you'll nod and you'll be happy and you'll be happy for them and everything. Then of course, a few months later, they're breaking up with that same person and you ask them, why are you breaking up with that person? So you're basically saying, please produce reasons for me that justify your current position. And I'm sure you've noticed they will say things like, well, I mean, the way they walk across a room really drives me crazy. Um, they kind of have this jangly, janky thing. I don't like watching um, the the way they talk. It's like like fingernails on my spine. Honestly, I can't I can't hear another word out of their mouth. The other day they were cutting a candy bar with a fork and a knife. Can you believe that? Can you believe a person would do that? I, I couldn't believe I was with this person. I wanted to leave. And the music they make me listen to on like road trips, I just want to jump out the window. So I hope you notice that these are facts. They're the same facts, but in different scenarios, these become different. They're used differently. The, the, the reasons for can become reasons against when the motivation to search for those reasons has changed. And you're cherry picking from all the available evidence, the exact same information to justify one position or another, which shows that the facts are neutral and they can be used to justify whatever you need to justify. What changes is the desire to justify, to justify, to rationalize, to explain yourself, basically to reason. And that's what psychology, that's where you're, you, there's a sort of a semantic thing that happens here. In philosophy and in logic, there's a, in rational discourse, we like to talk about reason with a big R, propositional logic and things like that, Hegelian dialectics. but in psychology, we talk about reasoning, which is a lowercase r with an i and g on the end. Uh, reasoning is just coming up with reasons for what you think, feel, and believe. And it's the, in, the personal narrative that you generate over time to explain yourself to yourself and others. And that is for the purpose of justifying and rationalizing so that you can maintain a sort of positive reputation with the other people, with your peers. We're always doing that at all times. And when we engage in the kind of conversations we think will change people's minds and we're dumping facts on them, what we're really suggesting is here's how I justify my position. And I am sure that if you saw these things, uh, you would then hold a position that would be similarly justified by these things, which is madness because you're really, you're, you're missing how you're using that stuff. You have a big blind spot for why those facts seem so useful to you. Cause, and you'll never change a person's mind that way because what you're seeking is to change their motivations and drives, which is going to require a much deeper exploration of why we feel the way we feel and do the things we do, which is not going to be available to you in a simple debate. Yeah, and that blind spot problem is so, is it applies. You can apply that in so many different ways. I mean, you know, like sometimes people talk about how 
uh, you know, only dumb people could join a cult or only dumb people could believe something like uh, the earth is flat. And, and I think, you know, and you find it's actually sort of the opposite. Really smart people can talk themselves into these to these this idea. <laughs> <laughs> the smarter you are, we have a lot of evidence for this, what I'm about to say, the the more intelligent you are and the more educated you become, the better you are able to justify and rationalize incorrect opinions, uh, uh, <laughs> the better you are at being wrong because the better you are at justifying and rationalizing how wrong you are based off whatever it is that's driving you. Uh, yeah, the more capable you become, the more capable you become of motivated reasoning and and. That's just, uh, yeah, intelligence and education does not l limit this. You have to have critical thinking skills on top of it. And those, a lot of critical thinking skills require almost a pilot's checklist that you have to, you have to learn it. It's a skill set. Uh, it doesn't necessarily come to us naturally because we're set up to, um, you know, we, we deal with things like confirmation bias and stuff like that because those are adaptive mechanisms for an environment where, um, you don't, we, for the environment that we didn't, that we evolved within, that we don't necessarily live in today, where, um, there's a trade-off between, you know, accuracy and, uh, speed of, of, of behavior. There's a trade-off between how much, how many calories you can expend on contemplating something and, and how, how, how dangerous a false, uh, negative or false positive might be. The, the rustling in the leaves could just be the wind. It could be worth exploring how is wind generated? I could become, but it's also, it's also probably really useful to just walk this way and avoid that just cause, you know, could be, could be a wild boar. Um, we're our natural, like our default state is not the, the, the thing that the scientific method gave us freedom to escape from. We, we had to invent that. That's a tool. It's a thinking tool. We had to invent it's artifice and you have to learn how to wield those tools to escape the down, <laughs> the downsides of our, uh, otherwise adaptive mechanisms for thinking and believing. Yeah. You know, um, have you, you know, a lot of people sort of, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, criticism uh, or uh, maybe criticism isn't the right word, but, but people sort of talk about there's challenges sort of scaling this kind of thing up. Have you seen much, you know, conversation on that? Like what are some ways that you could maybe scale this up? Well, yeah, there's, there are all sorts of ways to scale it up. The, um, I mean, we're, what we're talking about is the way minds change anyway. So anything that's reached any kind of scale of change happened the way that this works. This is just taking what works and, and, uh, and catalyzing us. It's, it's not inventing anything we don't already do. This is the way human beings discuss issues. This is the way they change their minds on anything. Um, and the way that typically scales up is through the cascade process. Um, I have seen on purpose scale ups, uh, when it comes to deep canvassing, phone banks have been a way to make it uh, work at scale where you, uh, you set it, you set up, well, you, instead of going door to door, knocking on doors, you set up giant phone banks and call people and have these kind of deep conversations with them about a particular topic. But the way it typically scales is, uh, through, uh, the cascade process. Um, that's another thing you're, everybody's familiar with, even if they don't know they're familiar with it. Um, if you've ever been to a party, and uh, everybody seems to be having a good time. And then you turn around and, and nobody's left. And you're like, what happened? Especially if you're the host of the party and you're like, why did everybody leave? Did I do something wrong? Uh, it's just cascade effects. Uh, human beings, every, every human being has a, a threshold of conformity. We're very nuanced in this way. It depends on all the experiences you've had. It also depends on the experiences you've had in that particular context. Some of your, a lot of nature nurture rolled in there. So you can think of it as uh, in terms of like, I'm making this very simple, but you could think of it as like you need 30% of the people in your community to do something before you will entertain the idea that you're going to do it. Or you need 70% of the people in your, in your group to s stop c smoking before you will consider not smoking, that sort of thing. So it's the, it's the threshold you, you personally need to meet before you will, uh, take on a, a behavior or extinguish a behavior or, entertain a new way of seeing the world, a belief, attitude, value, and so on. Um, and you see that in these, this party situation where you'll have, uh, there are some people in the group who either they go to sleep early or they have something they need to do tomorrow, whatever it is, they need to go. And maybe only one leaves, maybe two leaves. Once they go there, there, there's a threshold of conformity that's that, that of a 
the early leavers are people who are like very aware that, oh, some people have left and now it's time I think I should leave too because I don't want to be the last person here. Well, once they go, they've contributed to a larger group of people who have left the party, which means they meet the threshold of the next level of people. And once there's that many people gone, they beat the next threshold. And eventually there are people who normally would stay to the very end, but too many people have left for them. And you've met the threshold of, of those holdouts and go in several different directions. I've seen it for like, um, you know, people trying to get into a classroom is the example I use in the book. Uh, you know, what, if there's one person waiting to get in, they may be waiting to get in the classroom. That's, uh, supposed to start right now, but the, the door's closed and somebody's waiting and you show up and you see one person waiting. They could have any, this called an internal signal. They could have any sort of internal signal for why they're waiting. It could be, they might've opened that door in the past and were, were embarrassed to see that the class was still inside. Um, it could be a million things that keeps them from opening the door. You don't know what it is. So you assume they do have a good reason and you wait with them now without asking. So now there's two people waiting to get in. When the third person shows up, they see two people waiting to get into a classroom that, and they may think they may, unless they have a, unless they're a really have a real subversive punk soul that says, I don't care how many people are waiting. I'm going to open that door. If they join, now there are three people waiting and you can see a cascade is formed as, as everybody shows up, they contribute to the strength of the cascade. So I can tell you that when it came to, uh, when it comes to scaling this up, when it comes, when it came to a COVID vaccination, um, this is actually something that was done in the UK to imp to actually use this as a way to make something spread. They took, um, they looked for sources of trust and, and there's a, clearly a lot of distrust of the government and of the medical system in certain communities in the UK, especially those that have a, a history of colonialism and all sorts of weird stuff. Um, so in the Muslim community, they just simply said, what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll directly interact with, uh, the heads of mosques. And that's what they did. And they said, this is where we'll also distribute the vaccine. And what you end up with is, uh, you have all these, um, these sort of cohorts of hesitation. And when, what you're, what you're trying to focus on is the least hesitant among the most hesitant, which is a very specific slice of the community. And when they sort of distributing the vaccine at mosques with holy leaders advocating for what they were doing, they were able to get the sort of the early people in and they became a community that influenced the least hesitant among the most hesitant. And once the least hesitant amongst the most hesitant had flipped over to, I'll give this vaccine a go, you now have a much larger pool of influence that will take the next thin slice of hesitation and move them over. And you eventually start that avalanche, that cascade effect. So that's one big way to, to scale this up, but it all starts with one-on-one -on -one conversations that have to follow a certain flow for them to avoid the pitfalls. And once you have done enough of those, you can start to build a cascade from that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I want to kind of wrap up with something that we came up earlier was this idea of, you know, uh, Trying to make everybody think like me is kind of a misguided, <laughs> misguided idea, um, and you know, and maybe maybe you could just sort of speak to that a, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, um, I think the, um, like you know, when you you ever watch a movie, you know, like uh, I've been using as an example Top Gun Maverick for some reason because it's just fun to talk, use that one, but because I, I watched that with my dad, uh, it was the first movie he got to see. Uh, in COVID times in post COVID times. And, um, many times I've gone to see a movie with friends and I was real. I really, really liked it. And I couldn't wait to go out to get out of the theater and just start talking about it and like jamming out on all the stuff that we, that we saw. And, uh, I'm sure we've had this experience where you, you feel that way. And then you get out into the parking lot, uh, or you get out into the mall, you know, foyer or whatever, wherever you watched your movie, back when people did that a lot more often than they do. And you get out there and you're like, oh, wow, I love that. what did you think? And then they're, they're like, at least one person, maybe two or three are like, I hated it. And you're astonished to, to learn that somebody could hate this wonderful film. And they're astonished to learn that somebody could love this piece of shit. <laughs> and, and, then, and then you start having that conversation where you share the things you liked, they share the things they didn't like. And there's a little pushback in there, but there's a lot of, oh yeah, I guess when you, when you say that, I didn't even think about that part. 
and you start to move a little toward each other and you form a completely new perspective that wasn't I love it or hate it is something in the middle right uh or you might go way over like they might really like illustrate something to you that goes oh wow I didn't think of it that way that's what we were set up to do and that's how we've accomplished just about everything humans have ever done there are many different ways that we'll end up in like-minded enclaves it becomes important for us to sort of sync up and pretend we all agree about things that we don't really agree about but that ability to uh, argue effectively is there and when it comes to the techniques that i advocate for in the book most of them are about revealing to a person they could see things differently it's not really about anything in particular within the topic it's about how what kind of epistemology are you using and revealing to you that that's a thing you could like adjust um i can all of them have between eight to ten steps but to, for the sake of like talking about it here, you really only need the first two to really play around with it. Um, we can do it right here. Here's this something that it might be fun. I'll do it. Uh, uh, here's, all right, David. Uh, let me just do. What's the last movie you remember watching? Uh, let's see. Movie, movie. Oh wow, what was a movie? <laughs> it's a hard. Why is this hard? <laughs> it hard. <laughs> it's okay. I, it's okay. I mean, the last thing that keeps popping in my head is Last of Us, but that's obviously not. Okay, a movie. cool. The Last of Us. We can think of it as a whole series. You watch. You watch the whole series. I did. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Um, so spoiler alert, everybody. <laughs> sure. What did um? Did you like it? You know, it was kind of funny. I it was kind of a thing that I sort of wanted to not like, and then. And I kind of mocked it as I was watching it. And then at the end of it, I sort of like wished it wasn't over. I wanted to watch more. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it I mean, sounds I, like I you have liked to it, say yeah. I kind of liked it. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, I'm wondering, let, let's pretend that you're a professional movie reviewer and you just have a simple one to 10 scale. Um, what would you give it? One to 10. Oh, that's hard. Uh, I guess I'd probably give it like a, oh, geez, because I think it's also sort of ridiculous. I'll give it a seven. <laughs> a seven. That's great. So uh, you spoke well of it and it won you over and you said you liked it. And uh, and then we give it like the hard number. It's a seven. <laughs> right. And and that's interesting for a couple of different reasons, because I hear the words you're using. And then I'm also now I'm hearing like, OK, that means seven to this simple bit. Like, why not an eight? Why not a nine? Yeah. Why not an eight or nine? Well, yeah, I guess some of it is because it was a little bit sort of cliche maybe mm -hmm. maybe it would be maybe one of the things but it was still you know but it still sucked me in yeah the, the and uh and on the other side of it like you didn't give it a five or a four what what got it up higher than the five uh the mid-range for you yeah i i guess because it just left me wanting more for one thing <laughs> which yeah, kind of left me yeah. which kind of surprised me um but you know so I, it's hard to, it's hard to describe exactly but i mean the characters were good and and uh and the story was like i say a little bit cliche but yeah. still still fun i like it and are there um any other sort of hbo series over the years that you would give higher a higher score than seven to um Maybe like Band of Brothers, maybe. Oh, wow. So I'm wondering, like Band of Brothers, there's a little bit of cliche stuff in there. Um, and it's definitely one of those World War II tropes everywhere kind of shows. And I'm wondering what it did that got it higher than seven for you. Like, what did it do that The Last of Us didn't do? Um, I think with Band of Brothers, again, series can get away with this, whereas a movie can't. But but you you got a little bit more in depth with a lot of the characters, um, mm. and over longer time, and you got to know I think more characters and more more deeply. Um, yeah. And I think Last of Us was a little bit simpler than that. Yeah, and, and we could talk about this for a while. We could talk about this for twenty minutes, and that's usually <laughs> how right. one of these conversations will go about that long. But and this is a nice neutral topic to demonstrate what I'm trying to proselytize which is uh let's say i liked the last of us a lot and i was and you said eh, it was okay i gave a seven and then i was just like well let me try to convince you let me try to talk about it in a way that like says no no you should like it you should like it you should like it for the reasons that i liked it that was, that's nothing like what i'm doing here which is trying to hold space for you to metacognate to to not unjudgmentally listen to you and give you an opportunity to go in there and self-reflect and reveal to both of us, but more importantly, reveal to you, why do right. I feel this way? Right. And it's in there. 
and the thing about it is like, if I just ask you if you like it, that's very easy. It's almost like bumping your knee against the table and I ask you, did that hurt? And all you do is check in with your body very quickly. Did that hurt? Yes, okay. Yes, it hurt. When I ask you, did you like the show? It's very easy to access the attitude. It's just it's just sitting there available because you're just, you're just sampling your emotional state. Did I like it? Did I like it? Yes, I liked it. Yes, I liked it. When I say, where would you put it on a scale of, from one to 10? Now we're entering into a more metacognitive frame because you're having to, what I'm actually doing very subtly and without saying it out loud is, could you please produce some explanations, rationalizations, and justifications for your emotional state? And everyone in that place will go, will look up to the, to the left or right and go, hmm, wow. And you even said so. You're like, well, that's tough because that's what's happening. It's a completely different way of, 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 of approaching the issue. And my job then going forward is to just be there for it and hold the space. And the little bit of um, motivational interviewing in there where I ask why not higher, why not lower, that, that really helps you dig in. And in a full range conversation where you go through all the like steps you'll eventually get to like um like what method are you using to to judge the quality of those reasons which i was doing without having to say so because by going to band of brothers we're starting to pull out some specifics like character uh, characterization is important to you and characterization you know in a sense where you really get a feeling of this is a real person facing real things like maybe if there was more of that in the last of us there's all sorts of ways we can get there but the important thing is that you're starting to discover, well, this is why I feel this way. This is what's driving me. And even though we're doing it with a movie, we could have done that with gun control. I could have said, where you at on gun control? And, let's, and just to keep it from some, a person from going to one or 10, you can say um, a one means uh, uh, once a week, uh, you, everybody in America gets an assault rifle in the mail, no matter what your like criminal record is. And a 10 would be, uh, if you say the word gun, uh, and a police officer hears it, you get you go to federal prison for 10 years. Where would you put yourself on that scale? And it's very easy for a person, given those parameters, to give those, to produce a, a number or a percentage. And then we can get in there. We can say, well, how come? Why does that number feel right to you? And why not higher? Why not lower? And what will happen is the same thing. They will, for the first time, perhaps, realize, oh, this is motivated by something. And I've heard, I've seen this, I've seen hundreds of these cases doing, whether it's with street epistemology or deep canvas or another thing, where a, a almost magical thing takes place where a person is given the gift of discovering why they feel the way they feel. And you, you almost can't do that without changing your mind a little bit. It gives you power over your attitudes and it changes you. It gets you completely out of the, I need to fight you to be right and wrong because you start realizing it's much more complicated than that. And that's a good example of what we're going for here. <laughs> that's great. I, and I realize we're, we're going a little long. So oh, that's I, fine. That's I, fine. I apologize. That's fine. I, I, I did what I didn't want to cut. I didn't want to cut into that because that was fun. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. I realize we're going along. So, so I, I, um, I really want to thank you for for making the time. I mean, this is uh, this is this is awesome. I, I really love it. Yeah, it's the best. I, I, I keep discovering more. I thought this is not one of those books that I, I was able to just write and then put into the world and move on. Uh, I keep on my podcast, I keep getting, get, bringing in guests to help me understand this more. Sometimes people who've written similar books, but often scientists who are still exploring these things. And then out on the road talking about it, I just keep discovering more and more applications and more finding people connecting to parts of it that I didn't fully explore and feel like it's time to do that in front of uh, others. So yeah, it's been a real pleasure to do that here with you. Well, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That is it for this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. For links to everything we talked about on this episode, go to outrageoverload.net. Before you leave, let me tell you about our Facebook group. Join in to connect with like-minded listeners, discuss the show, and shape its future. Share your thoughts on outrages, give us feedback, suggest guests, and be part of a growing community. Visit outrageoverload.net slash join. And contact me on Twitter or Instagram, at Mr. Blog, and just say hi. Thanks for listening, and remember, together we can lower the temperature.